so today in 12 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to talk about globalization um, now and, and in the future, but also looking at the past to see what, what that means. I'll take Ireland as an example for a number of reasons uh, which will become clear. I'd also like to take up a slightly contrarian view on trade. Uh, trade is extremely important for economic development, but my view is that it's becoming uh, less important and in fact uh, investment, and particularly foreign direct investment, is becoming a more important aspect of the global economy. So, looking at those, those three things, um, global production processes have changed a huge amount in recent decades, and the rise of the multinational corporation has really transformed the global economy in many ways. Uh, now, that's not without challenges, but in my view, there are many more opportunities. And certainly from the last time the minister and I met in, in Ireland, I think in March, it, I think it's clear that uh, the administration here recognizes the very big opportunities there are for, for, for Argentina. I'd also like to look at other capital flows. There are many positive things from other kinds of capital flows, but there can also be bigger challenges. So maybe in this case, focus more on the challenges of other kinds of capital flows, sometimes called hot money, money that moves very quickly, and the dangers and the risks that, that come with that. And the third issue, it's not all multilateral and global. Bilateral connections still matter. So your relationship with your very big, large neighbor matters a lot to you, and our relationship with our relatively even bigger neighbor is very important for us. So that bilateral connection, uh, some discussion of that towards the end. Okay, so economists, when we look at economic performance, we tend to talk about output and employment. They're the two big measures for how an economy is doing. Output is normally measured by GDP, and employment, the number of people working in an economy. Uh, there are many problems with GDP. Uh, there always have been. So this concept was only invented in the 1940s. So when we look at economic history, estimates of GDP of the past are not very good. They're only guesses. I prefer to look at employment because we have much better data about employment to tell us about how the economy performs. So this chart, uh, this graphic, is the number of people employed in Ireland since independence. It's coming, it's coming. Okay, I just want to explain first. So, uh, it's a simple chart, but it just shows very clearly how many people were working in the Irish economy over almost 100 years. Now, you'll see something very striking about this chart, that for many, many decades, nothing happened. And then suddenly, a lot happened. So earlier, Barry mentioned the 1950s when Ireland had all this sovereignty. He put it quite diplomatically about how the economy in Ireland performed at that time. Uh, it was a catastrophe. To the point that in the 1950s, many people debated whether or not Ireland should have become independent at all. It was a disaster. Now, if we look at the first 70 years of independence, we see no growth in employment. This was the worst record in the developed world. Okay? No other developed economy never grew its employment. So this was not a good record. And then very suddenly, <coughs> in the 1990s, the economy exploded. And almost employment almost doubled in 12, 15 years. Now, my, my point is that this change coincided with a big increase in globalization, and in particular, a big increase in foreign direct investment. At that time, the European economy was developing in single market, and Ireland was very well positioned to attract investment, particularly from the United States. So, my view, and it's not a view universally shared by all economists, but my view is that the most important factor in causing this dramatic change 
from being the worst performing developed economy to being the best performing developed economy uh, was mostly to do with attracting very large amounts of foreign direct investment. Okay. Why does FDI matter? When we talk about global trade, what many people don't know, and this has been true since the 1990s, that the subsidiaries of multinational companies now sell more than total global exports, a lot more. Now, if we consider our sponsor today, Smurf, Smurf and Kappa, it's a very globalized Irish company, it has operations in many, many countries. It doesn't export very much from Ireland to other countries. Instead, it goes to other countries, creates jobs, and services the market from its subsidiary. And the amount that a company like that sells outside its home market is much, much bigger than exports. So this is why, in my view, the export piece, very important, but becoming less important in a, in a world of globalized production channels. We also know that the increase in foreign direct investment has been much more rapid than either GDP growth globally or even trade growth. So trade growth has tended to be around 8 9% a year for many, many years. But FDI, since the 1990s in particular, has been growing much more rapidly. So this, as I say, is one of the really big structural changes in the global economy. Let's look at some numbers. This takes all of the investment of foreign companies outside their home countries. It's a stock figure, it's a cumulative figure, it's not a flow. Now, the amount invested directly in other countries, this is not hot money, this is money long-term invested in other, com in other countries, is now more than $25 trillion. Now, that's between one-third and one-half of annual GDP. But what's really important is how fast it's growing. And one of the really big changes more recently has been the increase in the amount of foreign direct investment coming from developing countries, particularly in Asia. The globalization of corporate Asia is a really important big trend in the global economy. We just put Ireland in context. Uh, if we look at um, Ireland's stock, cum accumulated stock of FDI, it's similar to Italy and Russia. Now, Italy and Russia are much, much bigger countries. Ireland has 4.5 million people. Italy has 60. But we have a similar stock of FDI. So you can see how important, how big that is on a per person basis. Ireland has one of the biggest stocks of foreign direct investment. And that really started happening in the 1990s. There had been considerable direct investment between the 1950s and up to the 1990s, but it really qualitatively and quantitatively changed in the 1990s, which led to this dramatic turnaround in, in the Irish economy. So, to conclude, there really are, in my view, very big opportunities in this area and because this globalization of companies, in my view, will continue, provided there isn't a change in attitudes by policymakers and governments, that this will continue into the future and therefore provides that big opportunity. The globalization of finance more generally also provides an opportunity. It's a, it allows countries access to capital markets as your country has recently returned to. And this can be a very good thing, but it can also bring difficulties and problems. If we look at cross-border capital flows over a, a, a quite a long period of time, we see something very dramatic in the 2000s. Now this movement, this huge increase over a five year period, effectively represents what was happening before Lehman Brothers. A, too much money moving to too many places where it shouldn't be. Uh, and then when that happens, 
money is, is badly invested, losses are made, and things collapse. And that shows, I think, quite well what happened around the time of the Lehman Brothers. <coughs> so, Ireland's crash. Ireland also had a very, very profound uh, uh, economic crisis after 2008. It, it was one of the deepest of any OECD country on record. Its origins were in a construction property boom. Uh, we built too many houses and companies borrowed too much money to build those houses and commercial properties. Uh, this was mainly a failure of the banking system. It misallocated capital and policymakers not to stop bad lending or excessive lending. But that global financial bubble contributed. The money was there. So let's just consider briefly how a financial system normally works. Banks take money from somebody who has it and give it to people who need it. Okay. What, what's changed is that banks, instead of just taking money from depositors, can now go to international financial markets and borrow much more money and lend it out. So in Ireland, in the five years up to the crisis, the banks changed their very traditional way of taking money from one Irish person and giving it to another. Instead, they went to international capital markets, borrowed from Britain, from Germany, from other countries, and lent this money to Irish companies. And an enormous bubble was created. Lots of capital was misallocated, and then it crashed. So this is for maybe people of more technical mind. This is a, here, this chart shows the difference between uh, the amount of money the banks were funding from domestic sources uh, over the bubble period. So it effectively shows how much international capital was coming into the Irish financial system, and this is really what inflated this bubble and made it so big. Okay, so let, let's move on to Ireland and Britain. This, this is the, the, the question of Britain leaving the uh, European Union is now obsessing us in Europe. I'm not sure how much uh, attention you pay to it. It might be sort of some minor thing here, but it's, 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 I think it's fair to say that it's obsessing uh, us, us in Europe. Um, and particularly for us in Ireland, we have a very long and deep relationship with the United Kingdom and it's a very important one. So, in terms of how much of our imports and exports, you can see it's, it's very big. Of the goods imports, nearly one third of everything, uh, all tangible products come from the UK. So our retail system, our supermarkets, are very connected to the UK system. Our services exports, a lot, uh, and then services imports, not so much. But they're the four parts, services and goods, imports and exports. Now, this is clearly very important for us, but there's also a trend change. That's those four components of the trade uh, balance. But as you can see, all of them are showing a long-term decline. So Britain is still a very important economic partner for Ireland, but it's declined in importance from being by far the most important partner to being an unimportant partner. And it's this reason that Ireland will, regardless of what Britain does, stay in the European Union. I think it's necessary to say that to, to, to audiences because many people think that Ireland might leave the European Union if Britain does. I think I can say with 100% certainty that Ireland will not leave the European Union um, if, if Britain does. So what are, the, what are the implications? As I say, trade is still very important. We don't know what relationship there will be between Britain and the European Union. And because we will remain in the European Union, we cannot do a bilateral deal with the UK. If you're a member of the European Union, you have no freedom to do bilateral trade deals. So Ireland and Argentina cannot have a bilateral trade deal. Brussels, the European Union, does all of the trade deals for the member states. So this is a very big difficulty for Ireland. We don't know what that relationship will be if Britain leaves. 
exchange rate issues also. There's a, 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 an expectation that if Britain leaves, its currency will fall very sharply. This has big implications. As you know, when a currency moves, you have a lot of experience in big currency movements. Uh, foreign direct investment issues. This is a possible good aspect for Ireland. If Ireland remains within the European Union, companies based in Britain or companies thinking of basing it themselves in Britain to access the European market could come to Ireland. We already have a very strong track record attracting foreign direct investment. So this is one possible mitigating aspect of a British departure. But there are also other, it, it, other issues, particularly in relation to Northern Ireland. Uh, any, any, anything that makes that relationship more complicated is a, is a, is a, is a risk, if not a threat, to, to domestic security. Uh, and there are other bigger issues. For example, the European Union has become, uh, has changed a lot. Uh, Germany has become the dominant power within the European Union. Uh, Germany is a country that I admire and have affection for, it's a great country, but in a, in a delicate situation, in a delicate construct like the European Union, if one country becomes too, too powerful, it can cause difficulties. If Britain leaves, this will certainly make the European Union look more like the Eurozone, and that may not be a good thing. Thank you.